This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Uh, my name is Roger Jelinek. I'm your host of Book Worlds. And my guest today is Tyler McMahon, uh, the author of a new book, uh, Dream of Another America. Uh, and uh, first, we're going to find out who Tyler McMahon is. Tyler, what, uh, who are you? <laughs> As you said, I'm Tyler McMahon. I'm a, I'm, I'm a professor of uh, English here at HPU, just across the street, or in, in this building, I suppose, in another sense. Um, I'm from uh, Washington, D.C. area, Virginia originally, and I've been here in, in Honolulu for about 10 years. And have you been teaching all that time? I have been, yeah. 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 I came here sight unseen and, and then started well, teaching for HBU. The subject of the book is, the book, it's a novel. It's set in El Salvador mm -hmm. in part, or most, mostly. Uh, how did it come to be set in El Salvador? What's been your experience of El Salvador? Uh, well, I, when I graduated from college, um, very shortly thereafter, I, I joined the Peace Corps and was sent to El Salvador in uh, 1999, I suppose. Um, and I, I was a water and sanitation volunteer, so I, I was. What does that mean? Well, it was a, a program that mostly built latrines, but uh, I was uh, <laughs> fortunate to be to be matched with a. Um, I, though I, I have built a few latrines in my day, I was I was sort of assigned to a, a community that was on the verge of installing a big gravity flow aqueduct for about five villages that that didn't have any potable water. Uh, so I was I was able to, to go there and, and, and work on that project and, and live in a small little village uh, for about three years. And that was, this was the late 90s when I arrived. I was there 99 to 2002 or thereabouts. Um, so it was kind of the height of, of uh, immigration, you know, economic immigration to the U.S. Um, just tell me, where is El Salvador? So it's uh, it's in Central America. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's on the Pacific coast. It's it's kind of cut out of Honduras the way Portugal is cut out of Spain. Oh, got it. Um, it, it just has has a, a Pacific coastline that actually faces mostly to the south, but just because Central America is sort of oriented that way, and it's it shares a border with Honduras, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, and and you know you have to cross through Guatemala to get to southern Mexico. And, and did you choose El Salvador, or you were? I didn't. Um, I, I was sent there. I, I did. I did prefer uh, Latin America um, at the time. The time I joined the Peace Corps, particularly the English majors, were were almost all being sent to Eastern Europe, and uh, the former Soviet states that had just recently become become states. And um, you know they were they were having a very particular kind of experience where they were, um, you know, working in schools or institutions and. Yeah, and in many cases living in two-bedroom apartments and sort of having a kind of commuter thing. And I, I, for one thing, I wanted, I'd learned a little Spanish by that point and I wanted to keep going with my Spanish. And uh, I also, I was uh, interested in the sort of romance of the Peace Corps as I'd, I'd heard about it before and I didn't, I, that, that involved, you know, more of a, a and, living in a... And the Peace Corps <laughs> turned you into a water engineer? Yeah, exactly. From, from an English, all it took was <laughs> a plane ticket, and I went from being a, an English major to a, to a, a sometimes called an engineer, erroneously. But <laughs> so what did it actually involve? Well, it, um, it was a lot of things at, at a lot of different times. I, I, I guess it was mostly kind of community organization types of work. I mean, I, I, I was this... In the Peace Corps and, and other NGOs, they, they like to work in partnerships. So it's sort of assigned to a, a, a organization called PCI that I don't believe works in El Salvador anymore. But they had engineers and, and lawyers oh, and things okay. like that. And most of the funding had already been secured by the time I got there. I sort of, um, there had been another volunteer who, who lived nearby in a larger town who kind of, most of his service was was kind of a liaison to smaller villages, and he he laid the groundwork for me to go to Palo Grande. So your job was more community organizing. And, and yeah. Got, how big was the village? Uh, the village was a couple of hundred people, and as I said, I, I worked with um, with uh, about five other villages, and one of them was probably about the largest was probably about seven hundred okay. people. So. I should say that the, the the novel is set in the village in El Salvador. Mm -hmm and about the whole uh, migration mm -hmm. to the U.S. Uh, and the adventures involved in getting from El Salvador to the U.S. Um, having said that, uh, 
the, the, the family that is central to the, to the story, was a family you knew, or was it a composite family? Yeah, it's a composite of, of uh, it's strongly based, the, 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 the village aspect of things, the sort of home front is definitely based on a family that, um, that I was very close to and, and I took all of my meals with. Um, it was always a, a fun sort of source of irony to, for us to talk about you know, me being there and eating at the table that, that was sort of set with, uh, with, with remesas, as they call them, the wages that were sent back, back home from, from my you know, country. Um, and they, they took great care of me. I, I took, you know, as I said, I ate with them you know, every day and, and they really showed me the ropes. And, and uh, their, their kid, they had several kids. In the, in the book, there's only one child, but they had several kids who you know, really um, helped me learn Spanish and learn, learn about the culture. And, and about the politics of the village and things like that. So, uh, let's describe let's describe the book given that setting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what what's the basic story? In the, mm. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, the, the the heart of the book is is the the main character Jacinto sort of traveling up through um, through Mexico. He's he's sort of double crossed by a smuggler in the in the first chapter and and left for dead in the in the desert and then you know sent back to Central America as as many as many Central Americans are um, in that situation. And then he's, he, he decides to, to sort of self-cater and, and, and find his way to the States without the help of the smuggler after that. And, and um, his journey is really uh, uh, is, is a composite of a lot of stories that I you know, read or, or heard about um, or, or you know, studied and, and that kind of thing. Some of the worst tragedies that folks go through, they're not all that bad, hopefully. But he had a particular kind of guardian angel uh, and, and another major character in the book. Yeah. Was that somebody, was it someone like that you kn actually knew, or was that a... The Israel character, not really. I mean, it, it was, he was based on a lot of, um, I guess, like superstitions and things like that that you heard about from almost pre-Columbian Mayan stories and things that are about kind of these helper types and, and sort of witch doctors and things like uh -huh. that who believed in... And these but he guys. had a he had a, a, a kind of hidden history, right? Mm -hmm. He was a he was a fighter, right? Right. Um, what, what was he? Give some background on the revolution and then the continuing struggle in El Salvador. Right. Well, so as, you, as you saw it in that village, mm -hmm. you know? it, it, it is. You know, by that point, when I was in El Salvador, you know, the they, they call it the conflict, you know, but it was a civil war by any measure. Um, it, it had been over for for quite a long time, but it, it just it informed everything. You know, it was for one thing, they El Salvador got a kind of hasty, um, you know, uh, quick and dirty land reform after their war. So you know, you could say that that it, it certainly um, it changed the country, and and it, it needed to be changed because there was such a, a vast monopolization of the of all the agricultural lands, mm -hmm. but. Um, it, it effectively sort of relocated everyone. So, for example, the, the biggest problems I had with, uh, with the, the water project I worked on is there was one community that um, was all former guerrillas in the middle of you know, four others that were all former military. And um, they didn't get along, you know, and they, uh, they used different structures to organize their communities, they used different terminologies. Um, when the evangelical church came around, which was happening in earnest uh, in the late 90s when I was there, you know, previously it was a 100% Catholic country, and then, and then Central America started having these, what they call evangelical churches, they're, they're you know, Protestant faiths, essentially. And for whatever reason, they caught on more with the former um, army folks, and, and, and the guerrillas remained Catholic, and, and so it, it, it created a new dimension to this. Um, how did you experience that on a day-to-day -day basis in the village? Well, I spent a lot of time sort of trying to liaise to reach out to that to that other village, that guerrilla village, but much more directly, the family that I that I described, they had been former guerrillas, and, and in an even more kind of random coincidence, they were, you know, assigned a, a parcel of land and a home in the midst of, of former army fighters. So they were sort of pariahs in their own village, and me getting close to them, you know, influenced my relationships with other other people in the village. So it was all this, you know, overlapping kind of history that became religion, that became politics. They, was, they all vote a particular way too, you know, um, obviously. The and was this complexity 
part of everyday life? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think... Is it a part of an endless conversation? Or, or a, or or a or very wary. passive-aggressive, uh, yeah. <laughs> sublimated, you know, yeah. unspoken conversation yeah. <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and and I, I just think it, on a personal level, it, you know, there's just a lot of things that you didn't talk about, things that you didn't ask about, a lot of trauma that just went unaddressed, you know. But there was a memory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Was the memory maintained deliberately, or? Um, yes, but it was. It I was mean, from generation to generation. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think so. I mean, yeah. in some ways, it was it was something that that people never spoke about, but it was you know it, it informed all their opinions about their neighbors and things like that and about. I remember each in, the Northern I, in the Northern Ireland mm -hmm. conflict, the children were kind of brainwashed into taking right. sides. Was that the same true? Yeah, I think so, and um, and you know it it, uh, it it's just a weird juxtaposition of um, of religious faith, political parties, and then these you know notions about what these are the people that were shooting at my me and my brothers and things like that. So the story is, is about this kind of hideous journey from El Salvador to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, uh, undergoing all sorts of horrendous. Um, interventions by mm -hmm. various self-interested people along the way. Um, what sort of proportion of the village would, would have that kind of experience? Um, would be somebody in every family or? Certainly in many villages that would be the case. Yeah. My village skewed less so. I'm sure it's, 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 it's changed now, but particularly in northern El Salvador, in, um, in a region called Chalatenango, I mean, absolutely, one member of almost every household would be there, and it, it tends to work like that. Like, um, it, it tended to have a kind of uh, exponential effect. So, if one family had, you know, someone to receive them, as they would they would put it, you know, and, and I spoke to many people in my village who, I would say, you know, have you ever considered going? And they said, oh, I would love to, but I don't have anyone to receive me. You know, meaning they didn't have a cousin or a brother or an uncle that that would kind of take them in once they got to the states and. And in many cases, it's a down payment issue as well. You know, so if if one village got a sort of foothold, often you know other members of the village would would end up there, um, in a some place in the same city. A lot of the story is takes part in trains and, mm -hmm. and hitchhiking and right. and so on. Uh, just g g give us a sense of that, uh, of, what, of what that was like. Yeah, it's um. So, yeah, I mean, so. Big distance from start. It sure is. Yeah, yeah. to cover uh, on foot. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's a it's a strange thing. Um, for whatever reason, the uh, there's a, a train that's sometimes the train is called La Bestia, the Beast. Other times you hear the state of Chiapas, which the train goes through, referred to as as the Beast. Um, I, I kind of had it both ways in my book, but you'll see it you'll see it explained in different different senses. And this is like the the sort of narrow southern corridor of Mexico, where for whatever reason, um, it's you know it's very difficult terrain for one thing. So the train is one of the only ways to to move about. But it's also just a, a sort of a bottleneck in the in the geographic sense, where everyone needs to kind of move along this one corridor. So um, all of the immigrants end up sort of squeezed into onto these trains, you know, holding on from every angle. You you you'll, you can see pictures easily of. You know, just dozens of people on top of a, a, a train car, and you know, barely having having room for their feet or hands or whatever it might be, clinging to the sides sometimes, and that kind of thing. And, and how long would they be on these trains? Uh, mm -hmm. If they, depending on how long they go, but uh, uh, days or weeks, I would say. You know, usually it's weeks on, on train. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you you could you could go even further if you were so inclined, but mm -hmm. it's it's sort of um, it's really a thing down in in southern Mexico, and it's 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 particularly. Um, Problematic because it's it's certainly the police are opportunistic about about finding folks there, but even more so bandits and, and robbers and things like that find it a good place. We'll, to we'll take a break now, but we'll come back to our train. Sounds great. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king. Come banging on your chest. You can be the world. Talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Stand in the hall of fame. Hello, everyone.
everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech. And here we are back. We were just talking about these uh, trains that the immigrants clung to for literally weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had some pretty rough adventures along the way. Can you describe some? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's not uncommon for uh, gangsters to, to sort of assault immigrants. You know, a lot of times people are traveling with their, their savings such as they are and that sort of thing. And, um, it's, uh, it's very common for, for bandits to sort of stick them up. It's also common for law enforcement to, to sort of abuse people. For whatever reason, uh, you know, and, and I know this from, from just from research, not from firsthand experience, but uh, that Chiapas state is somewhat hostile to the immigrants coming up from Central America, whereas other states are, are quite welcoming, like Oaxaca has a reputation as being extremely kind to the people who, who pass through. Um, so there's a, a lot of internal tensions, you know, between Mexicans and Central Americans that, that sometimes lead to and violence. And is the, is the endemic violence of, of the whole setup uh, the result of the Civil War or is it a, a cultural tradition? You know? um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's based on a lot of factors. There's, you know, Mexico, unfortunately, has had a sort of rough time of it the last few years. And there's a lot of bad actors there that, um, that can be very opportunistic. Um, and certainly folks from the, the Northern Triangle of Central America, Hondurans, Guatemalans, and Salvadorans are, are subject to, to abuse at many hands. Uh, um, so it's certainly get the impression from the, from the story of uh, predators and prey uh, right. all along. I mean, everyone was fair game mm -hmm. uh, by everybody they encountered, it seems, you know. Right. Um, there's one particular predator that's mentioned as uh, much in the news, thank you, thanks to the president. Right which is the, the M13 gangs. Yeah. Um, the impression that, that uh, Mr. Trump gives is that they come from uh, Latin America and come to the US to terrorize everyone. What's the actual story? Well, that's, um, it, first of all, I, I think there's a lot of misinformation about, about MS-13. I, I really think a lot of our official accounts are, are not quite accurate. But the, the people that research this in depth would all you know, agree that the, that gang really started in Los Angeles, and, and most of their signs and, and lingo and things refer to, you know, streets and, and whatnot in L.A. Um, in sometime in the 90s, in the in the during the Clinton administration, there was um, an effort to deport felons to to you know felons. The bad guys. Right, right. That were yeah. foreign nationals, and this was something you would see at the at the airport when I was when I was in El Salvador. You, I mean, you you you'd often kind of hear those stories and see people getting off planes talking about, you know, just, just having come from a, the penitentiary and that sort of thing. So there was a, a sort of exporting of that gang culture that happened in many ways and it, it sort of took root in El Salvador. And it certainly was a, a big, you know, something that all our safety briefings covered and whatnot. There's a very, there's a lot of rumors that they're somehow related to, um, to you know, uh, factions of the Civil War, paramilitary groups, and I, I don't find that to be accurate. I mean, I think it's a different generation it really is a different different kind of culture but um there they're a big part of our lives as volunteers in El Salvador not a you know um, there was something you'd see on a weekly basis certainly if you're in any kind of urban area and in, in the in the in the village that you were in mm -hmm. uh, were there m13 people living there yeah there were there was one guy who was um kind of a notorious you know that they called him chepe mara because he had the gang tattoos and everything and he sort of was a drifter who would come in and out his family was there there were other people that you know there's certainly a lot of graffiti and there was a lot of kids who emulated the signs and things like that now apparently it's it's grown um in a big way, and, and, and from what I'm told about my village, it's it's sort of you can't you can't travel through there without being having your vehicle stopped, whether it's a public bus or a private car, and sort of have to pay off a, a toll essentially to use the road and wow. and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, I, when I was in El Salvador, much of the visible aspect of of MS-13 was um, 
homeless folks, people with substance abuse problems that were living on the street, that kind of thing. So it wasn't always, it was a, a widespread kind of social phenomenon. It wasn't just a um, extortion antagonism thing. It sounds like it's become more. Were, were you yourself ever confronted by, by them? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, on buses, I was often, you know, um, kind of threatened or you know asked for Did money. Did you pay the toll? Yeah, I usually just paid the toll. I, I figured it was worth it in the in the um in the the long run. Uh, the well, actually I remember one of my first times on a bus in El Salvador I was with two other gringos and my Spanish was a little bit better than those two guys and and um, a guy you know with tattoos and stuff got up on the bus and kind of went through a speech and and said that you know he was going to come around and collect and collect cash and if we didn't pay him you know he was gonna gonna hurt us and uh, so we gave him a little bit of money and all the other passengers on the bus were like just ignore him you know that sort of <laughs> thing. So it, it was a, it's always a hard thing to read as I yeah. said I mean it was um, a very uh, strange phenomenon I, I think that trying to equate it with other kind of gangs or, or, or kind of criminal movements is is difficult to do because it is a, a very unique thing and it's um it's taken hold with a generation in El Salvador that's um, that's had a hard time, and and uh, you know in many ways it, it was the kind of generation after the the Civil War generation, and um, their their issues and their problems were not well understood by their elders in some cases. I think um, I, I just can't the stories that I hear now. I, I will say one thing I I really didn't witness there is this kind of pressure on young people to to you know become a member or else I, that was not in my experience a phenomenon in El Salvador and it I mean it just is heartbreaking to read about because the, the the Salvadorans that I was around they just detested those gang members they they just thought it was just the worst thing ever they they hated you, you, they hate them more than Donald Trump does I can promise no, you that no, and, but, and just but in the reports that you now get in, in the in, in our media is that people are uh, leaving more out of terror than out of yeah. economic motivation. Absolutely, is that myth or is that? No, real? I think it's reality. No. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, the, you know, I haven't, I haven't checked this stat recently, but the truth is that um, immigration from Central America has been going down really since the late '90s. Really? And yeah. yeah, it has been. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a difficult thing to track because, in some ways, they use you know statistics of how many people are encountered and whatnot, but. But um, the, the real data nerds would, would tell you that the character of it, in my opinion, has changed pretty tremendously. I mean, it, in the era that I was in El Salvador, it was like the character in my book. It was a, a sort of economic calculus of, you know, um, my family's survival, they're not being work in this country, and, and, you know, we can go for a little. It was always an extremely reluctant decision. I think that's the great misunderstanding is that somehow this act of opportunism, like, oh, I can make a little bit more money if I, if I break this rule or cross this line. Really, it was a, a desperate situation and nobody wanted to go. No, people just don't want to leave their homes generally. It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing for anyone and the, those, you know, fathers and husbands and, and brothers that, and, 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 you know, mothers and sisters and wives that, that would go were always sort of looked at it as biding their time and, you know, being able to, to get their family out of debt, get their education for the kids paid off. And now I think it's, it's becoming more of a refugee situation. People, you know, fleeing violence at the hands of these gangs. And it's, um, that's a, 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 a real problem. Yeah. I know. Uh, the last part of the book is, it takes place actually in the U.S. The, mm -hmm. your, your main, your center, your main character actually makes it. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets into the U.S. through a pretty amazing tunnel. Right. <laughs> Have you ever seen that tunnel? I have not seen that. No, no. Um, uh, but it exists. It does, yeah. It and and I that uh, much of that chapter is um, comes out of Dante. You know? Yeah, it does. It <laughs> yeah. feels that way. Yeah. It's in those those uh, sort of um, gangs of, of Kids children that there. live there yeah. are is a real phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, there's a great book called Lives on the Line by I believe the author's name is Miriam Davidson that chronicles that sort of, um, that tunnel thing. It's not a, a really common route that folks use, but it is sometimes used, and it uh, sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> yeah. and, and at the time you were there, was the, the border crossing uh, as um, punishing as it is today? Or it didn't look, didn't sound like it in the book. It sounded as though 
it was fa it was fairly routine. Yeah, uh, but it wasn't cruel. No. Right. Uh, it's uh, it's it's only gotten worse. Um, it, it certainly. I think it was starting to turn while I was there. You know, I, I was I was in El Salvador for um, September 11th, of 2001, and. And um, the story, in the aftermath of that, I think border security tightened up quite a bit. Certainly in the mid '90s, you know, I, you can remember those, those that, some of that footage of folks kind of bum rushing the, the crossing in Tijuana and just kind of running across, and everybody was like, "Oh, there they go. We're not. It's not worth chasing them," kind of thing, you know. And uh, that's and unthinkable today. Isn't right, right. It? And it's it's been, you know, it's it's such a funny, the conversation about building walls and things like that. I mean, you. There's no wall that's high enough to that's any match for a, a, the kind of desert conditions that people walk through yeah. nowadays. Certainly, most of the Salvadorans that I met, their stories were of walking through the desert in Arizona on, for you know. Two Did or a lot of them die? That you were aware of? Um, I cannot recall anybody from the village dying. I do remember a lot of incapacity or incarceration. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, those conversations about well, we hope that they're the Americans get them and not the Mexicans and that sort of thing was was uh, often a topic that the, the the worst parts were often these um, you know dead silences where you'd be you'd be receiving communications telegrams or whatever from your loved ones and then all of a sudden it would be sort of radio silence and that was you know the coconut wireless in the village would always be did, did so and so rumor, hear anything yeah. about so and so yeah. no not yet oh well I bet this is what happened to him or I bet that's so what it was a, to him. a major topic of conversation oh yeah very much so yeah. very much so yeah. a lot of you know people that did have families there a lot of speculation about you know how they were they were the targets of thieves and things like that a lot of speculation about how much money they had and, and could they help us out if we you know have a sick child or that yeah. kind of thing yeah. so so this is your second book? Uh, my third. Your third, third novel, book, actually. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And what were the other two? Uh, the first one was called How the Mistakes Were Made. Um, it's a sort of rock and roll novel that takes place in, in Seattle in the early 90s and um, kind of the crazy things that happened to, to folks there. And the second one actually also takes place mostly in El Salvador. It's called uh, Kilometer 99, and it's kind of an expat novel about some, some surfers that that are in El Salvador during the big earthquake that so happened. So you're a musician, a surfer, and a writer? Well, mostly just a writer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Dream of another America means exactly what? Well, I, um, I kind of like to think of it as a double entendre. Certainly, it's, on the one hand, it's sort of an order, you know, uh, to, to try and dream of, a, of a, a place where we could accommodate a lot of different ideas about, about you know, who our citizens are and how we treat each other. Um, but it's also, I mean, I think when you're, uh, as a person from this country in Central America, the, the language kind of fails. You know, you're, you're still in America. You only know how to describe yourself as an American. You, you usually refer to your country of origin as America. And I guess... Um, and they're all Americans, too. That's right. Yeah. So I, I sort of, it's also the idea to be mindful of this other America that we often ignore and the dreams that they have and, and you know, how... How those might overlap. Well, the book has just been published. Yes. And your publisher is in Virginia, where you Correct. graduated. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Zivall Press. I wish you great luck with it, and I look forward to seeing you at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. In Thank May. you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Roger. Aloha. Aloha.